Rolling. Okay. Um, welcome everyone to this past lecture. Um, PASS is a collective of students who run events like this. Um, and our aim is to bring together communities, not just students, but um, those in the Portsmouth community and in the world of architecture and everything that involves architecture. Um, and today we are proud to host Cork in Studio. And we have Harry and Josh with us today um, and they will be sharing their expertise with us, um, which is very exciting. Um, so I'll hand over to them now. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for that introduction. Let me just share my screen. Two seconds. Uh, if I go full screen, you see that full screen? Yeah, we can see it. Awesome. All good. All good. Cool. Yeah. Well, th thanks for having us. Um, I guess we're going to talk a little bit about uh, our practice, Corking Studio, uh, and some of our work in international development, and, and I suppose. Uh, a bit of a chronology of how it came to be and, and the ways in which we operate our projects now. So we are a group of architectural designers that have been working on um, community projects worldwide, design and construction community projects worldwide for the last six years now, uh, looking to create an impact through the architecture that we're creating. So our kind of vision statement or ethos, if you like, is democratic education, quality design accessible to all. So we really believe that every human being should have the opportunity and tools to shape the spaces that they inhabit, that we should all benefit from the quality of life that's achieved through informed design. And importantly, construction has to reduce its environmental impact on our planet. So we kind of try to achieve this uh, ethos or vision through three main uh, pillars of operation, if you like, in the way we carry out our projects. So the first of which is designing through collaboration. So it's really important for us that uh, every stakeholder within the project, especially the end users, are involved for, from the very onset of a project, uh, you know, through the brief making, through the whole uh, design process, and then on site as well, uh, to make sure that there's that integration with the end users and uh, we can hopefully achieve and further the ownership over the building once we've left through doing this. Uh, we've then got learning through building, so uh, getting stuck in on site, getting hands on, and uh, really, yeah, putting our skills as designers or architects to the test um, and understanding and learning through the construction process. Um, so, you know, I think we find it is a really valuable skill uh, that architects can learn, you know, being able to translate uh, a line or envisage something in your mind, a design in your mind, but then actually understanding how that really does go together uh, in the final construction output is a really valuable skill. So it's something that we feel uh, every, every architect or architecture student should know. And then finally, experience through immersion. So on almost all of the projects uh, we work on, we uh, live alongside uh, the communities we're working for. So, um, you know, getting stuck in obviously on site, but also off site. So things such as cleaning, cooking, um, you know, really getting stuck in with all the, the chores. And that really helps us to gain a much better understanding of how uh, the end users and the communities we're working with use their spaces uh, and, and understand their kind of culture in a much, on a much deeper level than if we were um, you know, visiting as a tourist or, or something like that. So it started back uh, in our second year of studying architecture at university uh, in 2015. Uh, we just come to the end of the academic year. We were looking at a summer of, uh, of freedom, if you like, ahead of us. Um, and at the time, a lot of our friends and peers at university were studying um, or, or were doing internships and uh, work experience at various offices across the UK and Europe and putting their practice into good use that way. And I think we felt that this was something we wanted to do, but maybe in a more practical and hands-on way. Um, so we set that out by uh, contacting NGOs and charities all over the world, basically just saying, look, we're a, an enthusiastic bunch of architecture students. We want to see if there's a space we can design and maybe even build for you that can help further your mission or help your kind of you know, uh, charity out in some way. Uh, so we were really lucky that a charity called Friends of Koh Rong uh, on an island called Koh Rong off the coast of Cambodia uh, got back to us and they'd actually just set up a school on the island, uh, obviously to give the kids an education, uh, but also as a uh, way to give the kids a kind of safe haven uh, to get away from some of the negative impacts that tourism was starting to bring to the island, such about as alcohol and drugs. So. Um, they said to us, you know, we'd love it if you could design and build us a uh, outdoor playground, playscape, 
uh, and sort of outdoor learning space uh, for the kids to explore, you know, through creative play, but also to give them a bit more of a flexible learning space to teach within. Um, so this was the end result of that. We called it Playscape. Um, but I think what this whole process taught us or, you know, what we gained most from it was a real much deeper understanding of uh, ways of life for the local communities we were working with, a really good understanding of the ways in which uh, the local people build and a really great knowledge of, uh, you know, local materials and local methodologies. And, and you know, I think this is something that we found we'd, we'd learn a massive amount about. Obviously, some of the people we're working with have been building their own houses or their own spaces for almost their entire life since they were very young. So they really know uh, about construction. Uh, but we found that there was this really nice knowledge exchange on site where we could learn massive amounts from them about how to construct in these climates and contexts, but also that we could impart some of our kind of simple design thinking and, and spatial layout thinking in the hope that, you know, maybe in future, uh, they'll be able to take some of those tips on board in, in the future construction of their own spaces. Um, so this kind of exchange on site was something super valuable to us uh, and to the kind of people we were working with as well. And we felt that we had to just keep doing more of it. So after that first project, um, that, project that project was funded through a Kickstarter campaign. And we, you know, we were very fortunate that it was successful, um, but we kind of knew that it wasn't a sustainable way to run these projects. And we kind of exhausted all of our network of friends and family and their friends and their families. Um, so we kind of set about establishing a more formalized uh, structure of how we might be able to approach these projects. Um, so we kind of, you know, over the course of the next kind of year, we, we did two more projects and it was through that that we were able to identify which uh, stakeholders are kind of the most crucial to, the, to a project. Uh, so the first of which is the local community, as Josh said earlier, making sure that they're fully involved right from the very beginning with the brief, the design, construction and handover so that they have that ownership of the project um, and that they can ensure that it's going to be used and loved and maintained. Uh, secondly, we've got the NGO or local charity partner. So this will typically be either a figurehead or a community that's been based in the, or sorry, a charity that's been based within the area or within the, the, the sort of country for a number of years. So they have that uh, experience, the knowledge and the trust of local logistics, uh, local cultures, um, and they're responsible for organizing um, initial meetings where we're not able to be there in person. They're also responsible for fundraising towards the, uh, the material costs. And that means that we can focus on what we're, uh, you know, trained in and what we're passionate about. And we can offload that fundraising responsibility to the, to the charity. There's then the international participants. So you guys, architecture, design, engineering uh, students that are looking to gain a bit of experience in a different context, learn um, you know, how to apply their skills in uh, entirely different uh, locations, different climates, different cultures, uh, but equally um, also kind of share some of their skills and expertise in the, from their own education and hopefully improve the projects. Uh, there's then the local skilled workers. So on you know, the kind of early stages of a project, we'll work with the NGO to identify a few key people within the neighborhood or area that have a certain set of skills that are needed for the project. And this could be bricklaying, carpentry, uh, welding, anything like that. Uh, and obviously their role is you know, part of the construction process, but equally it's to train up ourselves, it's to train the international participants. And importantly, it's to train uh, local unskilled um, community members that are looking to build up their kind of employability and experience and hopefully increase uh, kind of econ economic uh, impact within the area. We've then got the sponsors and donors of a project. So this will typically be an extension of the NGOs network or an extension of our network. And it's people uh, inputting financially for materials or it's people uh, providing their expertise pro bono, such as engineers or environmental design specialists. And finally, there's us as a kind of facilitator, making sure that all of these different stakeholders have, have their say, uh, everyone's involved right from the beginning and end. And then of course, the actual filtering down the design process and managing the, this on-site construction. 
So as well as formalizing the kind of different stakeholders we needed in a project, we started to establish a clearer strategy for selecting projects and what we wanted those projects to uh, achieve in, in the long run. So uh, in terms of the project selection, the, the kind of first key thing is that it's, it's something which has been specifically requested by the community themselves. Uh, so something that they've identified as a key need or resource um, and then approached either the NGO or, you know, put a call out for assistance on this project. And it's, it's not something which has been dreamt up by an outside body and then, you know, brought to them. So that's kind of uh, once, you know, we've figured out the kind of brief, we then look for uh, opportunities where we can add value to a project. So if if the issue that's been um, brought to us, we think actually, you know, we can't use our expertise or our network to add a lot of value. And that value could be in terms of structural strength. It could be in terms of design quality. So better, uh, more comfortable spaces with uh, better lighting, better ventilation, et cetera. Um, then, and if we don't think that that's the project will benefit from that, then we'll, you know, happily say, and it's not really a project for us. And oftentimes the issue doesn't actually require, potentially doesn't require a built space and maybe an architecture solution isn't the best solution for it. Um, and finally, we'll look for opportunities for skill exchange uh, on site and beforehand as well. So making sure that uh, locals are learning from uh, our design expertise and from the international participants and our international participants are learning from the local communities as well as local workers. Um, so that's kind of the selection process. And beyond that, we look for the project objectives, uh, the first of which is a community-wide social impact. So we aim to take on projects which affect kind of a much wider audience than just a singular person or a family. Uh, so these are um, usually community facilities such as education, uh, health centers, uh, community halls, and something which is going to basically improve day-to-day -day life and, and quality of life um, and have a kind of knock-on effect beyond the building itself. We then look for a long-term economic, impa economic impact, uh, both in terms of the process of the construction, so increasing employability in the area, increasing skills, increasing education, but also in the function of the project as well. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about this project later, but finding uh, finding built solutions which generate their own sustainable income once they're built and through that sustainable income the community is then able to further develop uh, their own community initiatives without the need for any uh, charity aid or external input and finally we look for a low or positive environmental impact uh, again this is both in the function as well as the process so during the process, we'll aim to specify materials as locally to the site as possible, keeping the carbon uh, embodied carbon down to a minimum. And we also look to use uh, recycled, reclaimed or uh, regenerated material uh, wherever possible. Again, we'll talk about this project a little bit later, uh, but it's using reclaimed scaffolding from a, a nearby supplier. Uh, and then we also are looking at taking on increasing number of projects, which are with charities that have a specific environmental or uh, agenda that are looking towards tackling the climate crisis and how can architecture uh, have an influence and an impact uh, in that regard. So with this kind of new built up structure in terms of the, the operational structure, we, this was, we were coming up to the end of our third year. So we'd completed the first playground in Cambodia whilst we were kind of going through the, the, the motion, we had also managed to secure two more projects in Indonesia. Again, both playgrounds, a similar, very similar scale. Um, and we'd kind of completed these three projects and we knew that we wanted to keep going, but we wanted to push ourselves a little bit further, increasing the kind of scale and complexity of the projects we were working on. Um, so coming up to the end of, end of our undergraduate, we started to reach out to a number of different charities all over the world, you know, widening uh, our, our kind of contacting pool of people. And we were very fortunate that we heard back from the Nanganga Giving Foundation in Fiji. And this was the start of actually what ended up being a very long relationship with them, where we've been working with them almost every single year since and completed kind of six or seven projects. Uh, but for that first one, we had kind of, you know, eight or nine months of Skypes every two weeks, 
Um, and these, you know, lasting a couple hours each time. And really it's just to try and build up that trust between both parties, making sure that they're the right partner for us, making sure that we're the right people to deliver the project for them, um, making sure that we understand uh, the local logistics, the cultural issues, um, construction strategies, et cetera, so that when we arrive on site, we know that we can deliver it you know, within budget, within the time frame, uh, and to a high standard as well. Uh, so the reason we got involved with, with this project in Fiji is because uh, back in 2016, Cyclone Winston, which is one of the, the highest uh, category win uh, cyclones in recent history, struck through the whole of Fiji, causing kind of widespread destruction. Um, so there was a massive need and still is a massive need for reconstruction uh, after that, that occurrence. And equally, there's a huge importance on building back these structures, not just in the same way, but actually building them much, much, much stronger. So that in any case, any future natural disasters, which are becoming increasingly uh, more frequent and uh, more severe, that these buildings are then able to withstand uh, that kind of wind load, that kind of uh, force uh, on, on them. So that's where we were, uh, you know, could see that value that we could add in a project very, very directly in this, in this case. Um, so this was the first time as well we we partnered with uh, Center Space Design, which is an engineering company in Reading. Um, and again, they've been a, a massive kind of uh, support for us ever since, kind of helping out on the vast majority of our projects. So obviously when we're working in so many um, kind of climates and contexts all over the world, there's, there's kind of a set uh, number of design considerations that we always have to try and balance um, to come up with the most, uh, you know, value added building. Um, and so, so obviously the first of which is, is the budget. I mean, fairly obviously when we're working with uh, with charities on some of these projects, it's a, it's a pretty limited funding pot. You know, we've usually got quite a red line budget. It's not a case of get halfway through the construction period and realize we're running out of money and going and asking for more. Uh, we really do have that kind of strict uh, tight budget. So when we're designing, we really have to make sure we're factoring in every nail, screw, uh, a bit of timber, and, and, and making sure we can get the most value out of each of those elements. So again, making sure we're designing a space that is um, essentially the best value for money and doesn't, isn't necessarily wasteful, uh, you know, too architecturally ambitious or specifies, you know, extra spaces that could be uh, laid out better or more efficiently. The next of which is climate. So obviously we're kind of dealing with quite a variance of, of different climatic issues. So things like earthquakes, hurricanes, cyclones, flooding, that sort of thing. Oh. Alexa, off, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, so working with you know, uh, environmental design specialists um, from uh, you know, university institutions to make sure that we can add value through the design. And again, as Harry mentioned, structural engineers uh, so that we can you know, really uh, design to combat some of these climatic issues. The next of which is materials. This one's a really important one for us. So um, making sure we're sourcing our materials from as locally to site as possible. And that's important for two reasons. The first of which being uh, when materials are produced and sourced locally to site, they generally have a lower embodied uh, energy and therefore uh, we can build buildings that have uh, a lower embodied energy. Um, but equally, if we were, for instance, importing, um, let's say, steel footings from New Zealand to a project in the South Pacific in Fiji or Vanuatu, um, and, and specifying these kind of uh, unobtainable materials or expensive materials, then it's unlikely that once we've left the project that the community is going to then specify that same material again. So it's really important that we try to use what is entirely locally available and push it in, in terms of design so that we can achieve higher um, standards in terms of, you know, structure, uh, natural ventilation, lights, making a more comfortable space with the resources that are already available. Um, again, so that once we've left, the community are more likely to employ those design techniques on their future builds. Uh, the next we've got skill level. So often we're working with uh, obviously the international participants who generally are fairly unskilled or have very little construction experience. And as well as that, working with local community members who uh, in some instances are also fairly unskilled. Um, so when we're designing, it's trying to come up with ways in which we can design our buildings so that uh, elements are replicatable or um, easy to fabricate. So for, 
for example, if we build with portal frames as a structural strategy or construction technique, um, we can get a team that can build one or two frames on the ground um, and, and learn from that process. And once they've learned to do it once or twice, they can replicate that time and time again. And suddenly you've got this really kind of um, vast uh, experience curve where it might take maybe you know, two or three days to build one frame. But then once everyone's learned, they can build the next 10 within the next kind of one or two days. Um, so that kind of rapid uh, learning process is really important um, to also achieve the kind of construction timeframes we're working to. So that's the next kind of consideration is, is time frame. Often our builds or today, all of our builds have been completed within a uh, somewhere between a two week to three and a half month time frame. Obviously, that does relate to the scale of the construction. Um, but when we're designing, this means that we have to be thinking about ways in which we can have multiple construction processes happening on site at one time. So we might have half of the team digging, preparing, measuring and, and laying the foundations, whilst we've got the other half of the team uh, building the frames or some elements uh, flat on the ground uh, on another part of the site. So that usually around the halfway point, both of those things come together. The foundations are set and dry and the frames are all built. Uh, they're all lifted up and put into place. And suddenly you go from what looks like some holes in the ground and some flat pack frames to a structure uh, of a building and the process kind of happens rather, rather quickly. Uh, and that enables us to complete buildings in, in fairly short timeframes. We then got information or rather lack of. Um, so often, and especially as we're working in more remote locations, we're designing from a very limited uh, source of information. So it's often not possible uh, to get a quantity surveyor to the site to get really detailed site drawings or even in some instances there's not even a quantity surveyor that exists in the country um, so it simply would be too expensive to fly someone in so we're designing from things like google earth uh, google maps uh, and and just photos taken by the ngo or local community members that have been sent to us and during the design process that means that we have to be quite flexible in the way we design so um, making sure that if we do get on site and there are unforeseen kind of circumstances, um, you know, we can very quickly adapt the design to fit and to suit the site uh, that we, you know, maybe didn't pick up on our desktop surveys or through these photographs. And you probably wouldn't believe the amount of times we've had a, a full suite of photos taken of a site um, fairly comprehensively, but, you know, someone has failed to mention that actually there's a three or five metre drop right behind where they were stood taking the photos and that does actually influence the design or influence some, at least some of the foundations so um yeah being able to adapt to that through the through the design process is, is quite important and then finally um although not on every single one of our projects but again as we work on more remote locations uh, it's becoming more increasingly a consideration is access to the site uh, so how do we get materials to the site and how does that affect the design process so in in this example here um, the site was located just off a beach uh, on an island and the only way onto that island and onto the beach was through a really small gap in the reef which only a fiberglass boat could fit through so the, the boat you can see on the left here um, could fit through so all of the materials had to be shipped from the mainland where they were produced uh, onto this really small island but that meant that they would be offloaded from the, the ship on the right cargo ship onto the fiberglass boat and then taken onto the uh, the beach where they were offloaded and, and carried to the site and so when we're designing that meant that we had to think about um, not necessarily specifying materials that were too heavy or um, were too long and, and would exceed the length of the boat um, and, and, and then again factor in the cost of those boat trips back and forth to get the materials to the island and, and how that affects the overall budget so it really is a kind of careful balancing act of all of these elements to try and come up with uh, a final build or solution uh, that can kind of you know add as much value to the to the project as possible. So we're going to talk through uh, a few of our kind of key projects and I suppose the key elements within each one of them. Um, so this one is the Ramwa School in Vanuatu, which uh, is in the South Pacific, and we completed in 2019. And this one actually had a really uh, interesting um, environmental design element to the brief. So again, um, the charity we were working with on this one, the Tambok Project Charity, they're called, uh, had been assessing need on the island of Pentecost in Vanuatu post uh, Cyclone Pam in 2016, which caused widespread destruction and had identified a need for a school in Ramwas village. 
Um, it was a school that they had previously been supplying uh, learning materials to. Um, but in their kind of post-disaster uh, uh, post surveys, it also found this really um, kind of weird climatic issue where because of the village's elevation on the mountain, uh, they had really high humidity all year round, which affected a lot of their buildings, especially their school. And they were finding that there was kind of condensation on most surfaces within the building. And that also meant condensation all over the blackboard. So when the teacher was trying to write with chalk, it was really difficult and would be kind of moist and sodden the whole time, uh, as well as the learning materials that the charity had been sending out to the school were getting destroyed by this kind of constant, relentless um, condensation evaporation process. Uh, so they would get quite sodden and, and unusable fairly quickly. Um, so they said, look, we need to build a school, but um, we also want to come up with a solution for a library where we can store these books and learning materials that can prolong their life somehow. Now, obviously in a village, uh, in, in a remote village such as, as this one, it's not a case of chucking a, a dehumidifier and an air conditioning unit into a building to solve this issue. You know, there's not, there's not reliable sources of power and even what power there is, is only uh, on during kind of certain hours in the day. Um, so we have to come up with natural design uh, solutions uh, that can kind of overcome this issue. So we worked with design specialists, environmental design specialists at Cardiff University uh, to come up with a design solution that essentially um, was the library space was clad in steel roof sheets that were painted black. And the idea being that heat from the sun would absorb into the space, lower the relative humidity in the space. And when that was coupled with lots of natural ventilation, it would suck the kind of moisture rich air out of the building, out of the uh, space, uh, and obviously reduce the kind of contact with uh, moisture to the books. Uh, so with that we kind of coupled that with designing the bookshelf so that they increased air circulation around the books, as well as using materials like lots of uh, end grain timber. Uh, so lots of small pieces of timber with their end grains exposed that kind of act as sponges to soak up a lot of that extra uh, excess moisture. And during hotter times in the day, it can kind of uh, release that moisture and, and it evaporates and gets sucked out of the building. Um, so since completion of this building, uh, we've been monitoring the levels of uh, you know, temperature, humidity, moisture, uh, and have seen that in the library space, uh, we're achieving a 20% lower relative humidity than in some of the other spaces within the school, um, which is really great to see. So this was the 90 community hall completed in 2018. Uh, again, for us, this was kind of a a fairly big step up in terms of the construction kind of complexity. It was the first time we used these huge uh, pine poles uh, as part of the, the structural strategy and these were uh, delivered on a big kind of flatbed bed truck which had been you know loaded on from uh, the main from the main town nearby uh, with some machinery and obviously in these villages you know there's nothing like there's no cranes around and uh, it's something that we have to you know, keep in mind at the very early stages of the design, making sure that everything can be done kind of manually or with pulley systems or by hand. Uh, so, you know, we were quite fortunate. The the kind of local rugby team took it as an opportunity to get a bit of training in and, you know, very, very quickly pulled them all off the truck and carried them up to site and then lifted them into place. Um, but again, just kind of one of those tricky design challenges that maybe would be easy to oversee. Um, but yeah, this project was interesting in terms of its brief because 9D community are very well known for their Meke performance, which is the local Fijian dance. And people from all around the area, as well as tourists and international tourists, uh, come to you know watch watch them perform and it creates a part, part of their sort of uh, sustainable income as well. So they wanted to create this community hall that not only served as uh, the traditional functions of weddings, funerals, ceremonies, etc. Uh, but also would provide them a space to host these performances in a little bit more of a, a, a setting than just, you know, out on the grass. So the design kind of takes this crescendo shape, almost like a theatre, and creates two uh, stages, one out on the front there on the decking with the audience sitting on the village green. And then for the kind of e evenings or rainier days, you can move inside. And again, you've still got that kind of shape creating that atmosphere. Uh, but uh, so one of the kind of benefits of working in Fiji every year is that uh, because we were, you know, got this rolling uh, impact, we're able to revisit our projects and assess them and evaluate them 
uh, and check how they're, they're going. So we were lucky enough to go back in 2019 um, and do a little bit of a survey of how the building was being used. And uh, to our uh, surprise, I guess, was that as well as the kind of typical traditional functions, they'd decided to use it as a kindergarten two days a week, which was, you know, it's great for us to see that the project was flexible enough to host the kind of changing need or changing demand. Um, and because of the success of the kindergarten, the, the government had actually got involved and requested to uh, expand it to five days a week with primary school students as well. And as part of that, they would train up a, uh, one of the locals to become a teacher. Uh, again, so that's you know, perfect for us, able to, you know, and kind of highlights the need to create designs that are not too restrictive in terms of either, you know, the future developments, you know, these places are ever changing demands are ever, ever, you know, present and you never know when the next cyclone might hit and this becomes a cyclone shelter or it becomes a temporary uh, housing for anyone's homes that are destroyed. So this has got to satisfy as many things as possible. And that's one way in which we can try and kind of add value through design. Uh, so this one, this project was a, a big project for us for, for a number of reasons. Um, it's the Evergreen School in Zambia, so our, our biggest build to date. Um, so we were approached by a charity called Mothers of Africa that had been working um, with Evergreen School for a number of years and had observed that classroom sizes had gone for, up, had risen to 150 students per class um, per, or per teacher. Uh, so they wanted us to build a space that would uh, be large enough for additional classrooms and a teacher's office uh, and could then reduce those classroom sizes down to about 40 students per class. So giving these students a kind of a, a better access to their education um, through, through doing that. Um, but it was also an important one because often in some of the kind of contexts we're working in, um, prescribed gender roles are, are a bit are an issue are, are, are present um, so you know the idea of women in construction in some of these places is a bit of a taboo uh, and I think we felt that we wanted to lead by example and could use this project as an opportunity to do that to show that you know um, a career in construction should be accessible and is accessible to anyone um, so we deliberately employed a team of 50% male 50% female and as well as that a team that were 50% skilled and 50% unskilled so that during the process we could upskill um, and uh, you know increase future employability. Um, but equally important is because it's a school. Um, you know, a lot of the young women in the school could see that these perfectly capable, strong women working on the site day to day, and hopefully, again, as I say, lead by example to show that you know a, a career in construction um, isn't isn't off the cards and, and should be considered uh, if it's something they want to do. So this was uh, one of our first more uh, major projects in the UK. It was with the Eden project down in Cornwall. Hopefully most of you will know about it. And if you don't, you should definitely go and check it out. Um, but they uh, recently, well, it was back in 2019, became a national bee reserve. And to mark the occasion, they wanted to create a kind of sculptural beacon up on their kind of outer skirts of their sites and attract some of the visitors and, and uh, visitors up to this new area uh, where they kind of created this wild meadow. Um, and the, the kind of brief of the project was uh, to create this kind of wow image kind of structure, but equally it was to house a live beehive. So there's 50,000 bees living behind those double doors. And there's a kind of glass screen between the, the visitors and the beehive. So you can see all the inner workings uh, of all them, you know, the worker bees making the honey. Uh, we also worked with a, a bee charity that's looking to conserve the native Cornish bee and raise awareness of some of the issues uh, that the, the species is facing and some of the importance of why it should be uh, preserved and kind of increase the population. And so there was uh, kind of some information boards as well incorporated into the design uh, illustrating how the public could get involved and create their own impacts at home. Uh, this was the project that I mentioned was made from reclaimed scaffolding and you know that the, the supplier of this was the original supplier for the original Eden project that was when that was first built so it's quite a nice kind of full gone kind of full circle of those pieces used you know 20 years ago and then now again back on site as a as a semi semi-permanent structure. 
So this was the one that uh, Harry spoke about earlier, that, you know, a, a build, uh, an example of a building that can hopefully achieve an economic impact. Um, and that is the Buda Batika Coconut Oil Processing Plant. Uh, the same project where we had to kind of get all the materials through the gap in the reef and onto the beach. Um, so this project came about because uh, on the island of Batiki, there are four villages, uh, which are made up by about 300 villagers. And they had been producing uh, raw Fijian coconut oil um, and selling it you know, nationwide around Fiji. And they kind of upscaled their production so much uh, that they were, you know, and they were, and they were selling quite a large amount of this coconut oil, but it meant that they were also producing it in all of the spaces they had available to them. So, you know, the community hall, the church, even their own homes. Um, so they really needed a dedicated space to, to do that and a space that could kind of tailor to the production process and, and make it easier. Um, but also a space that could reach the kind of, uh, required food hygiene standards so that they can actually sell to a wider audience more internationally, such as, Australia and New Zealand. Um, so, so that's why we kind of built this dedicated facility that catered to that production process. Uh, and, and since completing this, um, we've actually been told that they have been, uh, the community cooperative uh, have been looking at producing alternative uh, products that stem from coconut oil as well. So uh, I think they're currently looking at a contract with Patagonia uh, to produce surf wax, wax in the shape of coral. Uh, as well as using some of the waste products like the coconut husks uh, into in the manufacture of uh, sunglasses and, and products like that. Uh, so yeah, really great to see how the kind of facility has, has grown and, and is now you know, producing other products that can again produce a, a more uh, sustainable and long-term income for the communities on the, on the Batiki Island. So having sort of, you know, completed, pro completed a project, then we've got to make sure that we're uh, involved from then onwards, making sure that we can learn from the built project, what went well, what didn't go well, uh, revisiting it um, post, you know, post occupation, uh, and see where we can uh, integrate and respond to, to, you know, to what we find. So this was the Noeni kindergarten, uh, yeah, Noeni kindergarten, which we completed uh, in 2017. It was our very first project in Fiji. Um, and when we first arrived on site, there was eight students being taught in the local canteen, obviously a very, you know, dark, dingy, ill-equipped space. Um, and then, you know, we worked over the course of eight weeks, constructed this new, new space. And then one year later, we went back to find that the attendance had gone from those eight students all the way up to 35. And it was now being, they were now having to turn away any new applicants. Uh, so that was great for us to see that, you know, the kids had made it their own or the you know, the work was being hung up on the walls, it was super homely, um, but, and, you know, it obviously attracted more people to send their kids from the surrounding areas, but actually we could have kind of highlighted the need to uh, design in even more flexibility and try and sort of anticipate what the knock-on effect will be of, of, of the project. Uh, so we actually went back to the charity we were working with originally and kind of discuss this issue uh, with them about how they're ha now having to turn away new, new students and decided that the best way forward would be to construct a second classroom alongside the first, uh, which would utilize a new teacher that they'd recently hired and allow them to have those two classes running simultaneously and then increase their attendance up to over 50 students. Uh, so as well as, you know, kind of that issue of the, um, the attendance, we'd identified that the space was being used as a kind of meeting space outside for some of the parents and the teachers to hang out before and after school. So we thought it would be good to use some of the budget towards a bit of a play space and a canopy that would allow us to be a bit more experimental with uh, the structure and see, you know, push ourselves a little bit further as to, you know, what we can build with, with the kind of limited resource there, there is there. So as well as uh, analyzing individual projects, we took the opportunity uh, last year during the kind of postponement of, of our builds because of coronavirus, we had a little bit of extra time on our hands to conduct a impact report, uh, looking back over the last sort of five, six years as to you know, what we've been working on and you know, what that impact has been beyond just you know, number of projects, but actually uh, you know, education, number of hours on sites, uh, who we've, who's been involved in terms of employment and increasing sort of economic impact. Um, and I think what we 
are constantly trying to demonstrate and hopefully is clear enough in this talk is that uh, as well as you know architecture creating an impact through the final finished built outcome and what the project's then used for there's an equal opportunity to create a massive impact in that whole process that's leading up to it so throughout the whole design and construction uh, you know process there's tons and tons of opportunities and even on you know private or developers projects in western contexts as we you know we feel that there's tons of missed opportunities to uh, use it as a, as a tool for education and as, as a tool to to create change um, yeah. so moving forward clearly um a lot of our work is is very international which of course the pandemic has had quite a, a large effect on um but i think you know we'd always been uh looking to work on more uk projects and i, I suppose in in some ways coronavirus has, has gifted us that time um and i think you know it, it's it's quite easy to be able to apply the kind of working methods that we've uh, uh, learned from our international development projects to um, projects closer to home and social issues closer to home. So looking to tackle things like uh, mental health, loneliness, um, homelessness through uh, built interventions that can either raise awareness of an issue or, or formally tackle it through through this kind of space. Um, so. Yeah, we're, we're working on a number of kind of installation projects, um, art installations, um, small structures, um, and and even even as far as consulting with uh, larger practices and larger firms on on ways in which they can um, create an impact through their process and through through their projects. Um, so, in addition to that, obviously, with more time on our hands, we've been looking uh, at working on more competitions as well. Um, so even competitions that don't necessarily have a social or environmental agenda to their brief. It's looking at ways in which we can answer that, uh, the, the, the brief through, um, through a design, which maybe does question some of the kind of social and environmental impacts uh, opportunities and, and tries to outline those. Uh, but again, also looking to collaborate with other practices or uh, even students on um, competition entries. Uh, you know, I think we really feel that strength you know strength in numbers is definitely a thing and that through increased collaboration um you know we can all achieve achieve more and then also looking at uh ways in which we can kind of take the educational offering that to date had been um you know on site and physical and construction and in person um i think we found that there's actually been quite a large appetite for people to learn about the process of of our projects and and, and everything that goes on I suppose almost behind the scenes before we get on site. Um, so through, by looking at conducting virtual workshops that surround uh, issues, research topics and issues that we're passionate about as a practice. Um, so this example here looked at uh, an issue that's obviously very close to our hearts uh, with so much work in the South Pacific and that is looking to try and tackle um, this kind of ongoing problem of hurricanes and cyclones destroying buildings and people having to that or restoring homes as well and people having to rebuild from the ruins um, so looking at ways in which we can build up this body of research through these virtual workshops uh, to create a resource for um, sustainable prototype housing that could hopefully overcome some of these issues structurally uh, and, and materially um, uh, so yeah i mean this brings us up to uh, this year and what we're working on at the moment so as well as those kind of UK based projects, competitions, etc. Uh, we've got a number of international builds, which we are, you know, keeping our fingers crossed as much as we can do about whether they can go ahead or not this summer. Uh, but each of those projects uh, across Vanuatu, Zambia, Indonesia and Fiji will have a corresponding virtual workshop. Uh, these actually started this week on Monday and run for six weeks. So uh, it's kind of you know pretty last minute but if anybody is interested um in signing up then you know feel free to and uh we can you know catch you up on the like the kind of last couple of days of of work all of that has has been recorded um but yeah so that's kind of where we're at to at the moment um so yeah i suppose that, that brings to the end of our presentation uh obviously uh if anyone's got any questions then feel free to ask but a little bit of a, a last minute shameless plug if anyone wants to follow us on Instagram, it's at Corkin Studio. Uh, so, so go check that out. <laughs> so yeah, does anyone have any questions? That's great. Thanks, guys. I, th I thought that was really inspiring hearing about how you 
um like tackle like small scale like really like in there are really important projects that you're working on and it's really interesting to hear about how you tackle that with them like budget and everything as well um, i don't really have any questions but i'll let anyone else um, um i have a question but i, I can wait let's just see who else has uh, something to say um I have a question, guys. Um, yeah, I think it's like it's amazing that you guys um, were able to start like working on new projects so early on. I'm just wondering how you guys managed to get involved with these projects so like early on in your architecture pathway, um, and like how you found like balancing that with your degree and stuff. Oh, not your degree, but like the whole thing. <laughs> Um, I think I'll go at the end there, but I think I've got the gist of the question. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I suppose early on it was maybe we had a bit of a naive ambition and maybe that helped us in a way. Um, it was just a case of sticking our neck out there and, and reaching out to as many people as possible uh, to try and make this work. I think at that time as well, obviously, we, we didn't have any portfolio of, or anything to show. Uh, so I think the, the initial hurdle that we had to get over was basically trying to explain to someone what it is we wanted to do and why we wanted to help them. Um, and I think once we managed to do that with one or two charities, it was then kind of spending enough time speaking with them and gaining their trust and planning for the project so that they could kind of help us facilitate it. But equally, I think at the time, because we were basically, you know, there was almost no risk for the charity we were working with because we were designing, building and funding the project. All they had to do was kind of give us a, a piece of land and hope we didn't make a mess of it. Um, so I think that enabled us to kind of get off the ground and, and meant that, you know, the charities we were talking to were kind of willing to take a punt on us, I suppose. Um, and then obviously moving forwards with a, with a bit of a portfolio behind us, it was a bit easier to kind of convince people that we could deliver on the projects, but also convince, can, you know, be able to show people what we've done in the past and how that could relate to the projects we were discussing with them. Um, and then in terms of how it kind of related to our studies, uh, obviously it was a bit of a juggling act. Um, uh, I think, I think it definitely taught us to be fairly organized with our time and to kind of prioritize as best we could. And I suppose it meant that when we did allocate time to, to pursuing, you know, these projects, we were quite efficient with it and it was, you know, get our heads down and work on that. And then again, when we went back to studying, it was trying to be as efficient with that as possible. Um, I mean, we'd be lying if we said that uh, it didn't have an effect on our studies. I think, um, you know, we did we did put a lot of time into this while we were studying, um, probably a little bit to the detriment of, of our degrees. But, um, you know, we all passed. We're all here. So <laughs> uh, it wasn't the end of the world. Um, but I think it, it helped us to also gain a, maybe a, a deeper understanding of uh, design strategies or, or uh ways in which you can kind of answer briefs or dissect the brief and then uh, apply design thinking to it, uh, which maybe we wouldn't have got that experience if we hadn't, you know, at university, if we, if we hadn't have done this. So I think it kind of helped and hindered us in, in some ways. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. Does anyone else have any questions? There's a question in the chat there. I think Jackie's got a couple questions she wants to ask. I don't know if you guys can see those or not. Yeah, uh, so yeah, first question, using local resources uh, that were once used and were recycled, is it easy or have you had any difficulties with uh, resourcing them? Um, yeah, I think it, it's, it's definitely very, it is time, it's definitely very time consuming, uh, finding the right materials and collecting them for a project. It also means the, the kind of sourcing of materials and the design process has to happen in tandem or almost be flipped on its head and the the sourcing of what you can find or what's been you know what's in the area what's what is waste then informs the design process afterwards so that's kind of if you have uh you know a tight time frame that could potentially can become difficult i mean we've had the most success with it in the uk on projects in the uk i mean the, at the very start of uh, Corkin, we were involved in two modules at Cardiff University, which uh, was specifically around, they're, both, they're called Lost and Found, specifically around finding 
waste product, waste materials from construction sites, from skips, you know, whatever the demolition sites, um, and then collecting it all. So actually, the you know the two the two tutors running that module spent kind of two or three weeks beforehand going around with a van collecting up tons and tons of of waste, and then the actual on site construction again was only about two weeks. So it's kind of fifty percent resourcing the stuff, and then fifty percent on on site construction. So it is resource heavy, um, but if you are working on a project which is very tight budget, it can save a lot of costs. It can it can make the design more interesting as well, because you have these kind of interesting, you know, maybe you wouldn't necessarily expected it. Josh actually built a um, a kind of bonfire you know, kind of garden shelter uh, during our masters as part of his degree, and you know, one of the materials that he found from nearby Skip was the kind of rubber flooring from gyms so the university gym had been you know cleared out and renovated and so it's kind of like a material that is extremely hard wearing and you would never expect or think to, you know design it into your project but as soon as you find something like that it can make the, make the whole design more interesting um but yeah that's that, that. no. <laughs> um mind blown that you started this whilst you're undertaking your undergraduate in architecture do you have any good tips for organizing and timekeeping um, I think, yeah, I think as, as I said before, maybe it was a conscious thing that, you know, we knew we were splitting our time between this idea and our studies and, and that, you know, we obviously didn't want either of them to suffer. Um, so it was being quite, uh, quite conscious of that and making sure that we are being really effective with our use of time. Um, I think, I think, I mean, actually myself and Harrison are quite different in how we, kind of like to organize things for me I'm very much like like to set goals at the start of a day and um you know try and keep myself to to those time frames um whereas I think you know Harry will I don't know you, you kind of find productivity at different points within the day uh so I think it, it, de it definitely varies for each person um but you know it, it's getting into your working rhythm and finding out what what works best for you which which obviously can take some time as well and I, and I think, you know, we were definitely not experts at it at university, for sure. Uh, we're still not now, but, um, you know, we learn all the time. I think it, it has to be something that you're very passionate about. And obviously, the more interested you are in the subject or this project or your own initiative, the more kind of motivation you're going to have to work on it and carry it out. And equally, if you're partnering up, if you partner up with someone on it that is, has that kind of equal interest, then it kind of holds you accountable to do work as well. Because there was a group of us, it was, you know, it kind of almost forced all of us to work together on it and to keep, keep things going. Otherwise, you know, if one person's doing all the work and the others aren't, it just doesn't sit well with anyone. So, uh, you know, finding people to collaborate with was very key for us. Um, and equally, not being precious over decisions, knowing that we're not always going to make the right decision, but we just have to make a decision and not dwell on it for too long I think that's kind of the one of the most time consuming things that architect spends you know many hours on a day is just deciding between three four five different options and exploring every single option to the nth degree which whereas actually the reality is you know no one's got time to explore every option and you've got to just make an educated uh, decision you know pretty quick I don't know if we, should we read out more questions or has anyone else got a question? Well, Rachel is um, saying in writing what um, I would have not probably been able to articulate so well. Um, her question is around uh, working with local designers, design students. It was part of actually a, a question I did have for you. Can I just say, guys, by the way, just really thank you so much. It's um, a presentation of a real amazing position, really. And I think that the, the quality of the work and as you say, the impact that it's had is all because there's an amazing sort of just understood, um, we've begun to use this phrase as an ethos, kind of just an ethos of care. And that is so clear in your work, um, you know, just, just from the, and, it, and it, you know, it then comes out in, as you guys said about um, 
uh, this time in the pandemic and, you know, how are you twiddling your thumbs? What are you doing? And then, you know, there's competitions out there, as you say, which, and this is such a great message, please, for this, for colleagues of, you know, students here, is that, you know, you look at a competition and it might not have explicitly some social agenda or whatever, but actually everything does anyway. And, and to look at it and understand it in that way so explicitly is, um, really fantastic and so thank you so much for for coming um and showing us this work and 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 the way you do things i've been involved myself in in um a lot of one-to-one -one with students building stuff in various institutions and and port smith does it as well uh one-to-one -one work um and building with students um i was just curious um, about the uh you know, the way you bring in the educational aspect, not only for the communities, which is the most important, really. Um, you know, I love your thing about 50% women, 50% women, 50% skilled, 50% unskilled, you know, and that idea that you're actually doing something in the community, which is through building, through architecture, through making, is fantastic. How do, how do these, how, do, how, do, how would students, for instance, get involved with some of your projects? Um, I don't know, you know, is it, is it like a summer school thing or how, how is that arranged for you? Yeah, no, that's exactly it. It's um, so we kind of run projects usually over the summer holidays. Uh, they vary each year. Um, this year there's projects in Vanuatu, Fiji, Zambia and Indonesia, all with different briefs um, and, and they're all on our website. So just corkingstudio.com slash join us. And there's, there's, there's tons of information there. We've also got a, kind of self-initiated curriculum. Um, so that is kind of catered towards the ARB curriculum. We've stuck a bit of our own uh, teaching and, and methods in there as well, which relate more to kind of construction things, um, uh, which we've kind of spent time looking, studying other curriculums, places like uh, Centre for Alternative Technology in Wales um, and, and other places like that. Um, so that's all on our website. Um, but yeah, kind of run as, as short and sharp educational workshops usually between three to eight weeks on site um how, how are those how are those i'm just curious sorry practically speaking in terms of finances and how a student would how, how does that work for you guys sure so there's uh, a kind of course or workshop fee uh for, for each project and obviously that also varies depending on time scale or where the project's located as well uh and so we encourage students to fundraise uh towards that uh, I'm not necessarily sure about Portsmouth, but I know that a number of universities that we work with do have like a, a school or it's usually called like a global opportunities or an outward mobility yeah. office. Yeah, yeah, we have that as well. Okay. Um, so often there's funding opportunities there for sending students abroad, especially when they are educational related opportunities. Yeah. Um, I mean, in addition to that, you know, we've had some really creative fundraisers in the past. Uh, we've had someone who went around all of the coffee shops in Sheffield and collected all of their waste coffee grind, used it to turn into a coffee a facial kind of coffee scrub, uh, and then sold that to fund some of her place on the trip, which was really creative. Um, you know, other things like sponsored events, uh, grant, there's even travel grants for young people out there as well. Uh, I suppose it's just about knowing where to look for them. And that is something that we, we can help with too. Um, can I just ask, do you welcome students from different disciplines as well? Yes. So, I mean, obviously we are designing and building buildings, so it does generally cater more towards students in the kind of built environment professions. But uh, that's not to say that we don't, that we only explicitly accept architecture students or young professionals. It's anyone from any subject can come and take part. You know, we think building is a universal thing. Um, obviously that you know an architecture student potentially might have more to to learn from the process that they can apply to the, to what they do but i think yeah you know the skills learned on site and problem solving are definitely applicable to all walks of life i think the other thing that comes out really crystal clear is the whole what's the phrase circular design i mean you know this idea that um i know it, it kind of labels what you guys do but what the way you guys do it is better than the label to be honest I mean, I've just had a look at your site. It's a very nice site, by the way. Um, and it's, you know, it's really the understanding that it's, it's not only the complexities and the interrelationships in that kind of ecosystem or the ecology that you're 
building in, and I say ecology, I mean broadly with community and climate and everything else, but it's also this, this understanding, you know, back to the impact um, and also back to the pre, <laughs> you know, not even getting there and knowing that, and I really like that, um, you know, that, that understanding that you can only do it in a particular boat of a particular size, you know, and that is part, that is the architecture, that is the building, that's part of the thing and you can't not, se you cannot separate it out from that particular thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I really like the, the um, using you as an example, if I may, you know, in the sense of stuff that we teach about that kind of complexity, that kind of, um, you know, how do we make sure these things are on site and the involvement of different types of people and how that's all a part of the, the architecture, the spatial design. Um, and it just comes out so clear in your, your work and your statements. Um, so I just want to thank you again for that. Thank you very much. And we will invite you um, somehow, you know, just, just understanding that there's a, there's a workshop here for, for some level and, and some, you know, and maybe it's about bringing you in and having a workshop that, that enables students from various levels. And, and I don't think you're worried about that really. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I was going to say actually, because we've, as well as our international uh, builds and workshops, we have worked with universities in the past and hope to work with, you know, more in the future with doing, you know, shorter one or two week workshops on the, you know, university grounds or within the city that they're based. Um, and I think there's just, you know, there's so many opportunities for that to happen. And it sounds like you guys already have something like that in place as well, which is great. Um, yeah, but the more the more the, the more the merrier, and you know, it's 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 also having people come in from the outside is also really nice. Um, so so yeah, great. So anyway, sorry, I'll shut up. And <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 thank you. Um, I mean, in the chat, the question uh, about local work with local designers and design students. Um, yes, we do, and we are trying at the moment to try and. Um, create more formal partnerships in some of the country and universities uh, in some of the countries we're working in. So looking at working uh, with the University of Namibia and also the University in Zambia uh, about basically getting local students onto the sites as well um, so that they can learn from the construction process. Uh, and actually in some cases we're looking at um, projects where it's an entirely local student cohort. Um, obviously, because you know some of the funding does come from overseas international students that take part in these projects. Um, it, for those for the for those projects, it is a case of trying you know making sure we can cover those costs in other ways. Um, but yeah, we're, we're kind of constantly looking to strike up relationships with other schools of architecture in some of the kind of contexts we're working in, um, or even you know in some places there isn't even a school of architecture. So it's just nice to be able to work with young people in these locations to kind of maybe teach them a little bit about what architecture is or, or what design is. And I think that that is important. And that's really lovely, I think, because then you're planting a seed, aren't you? In the way that you were doing with the female construction workers, I thought that was really interesting. And maybe a bit like educators, ultimately, your aim might be to redu be redundant in those areas, you know, because... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. Um, I mean, we've spoken about this a lot, and I think, you know, we're trying to steer towards working on projects that can have uh, a, a much wider impact maybe. So obviously a school sure does impact maybe, I don't know, you know 500 kids and, and whoever interacts with that building. But if we can work on uh, maybe a policy level, so like with the uh, sustainable prototype housing that we research kind of body of work that we were talking about before, you know, if, if that's something that can be rolled out across an entire country and can influence you know, uh, an entire country worth of communities um, and without us even being there, then, then that would be awesome. And hopefully that's what we're striving for. But obviously it's about, right, you know, finding the right contacts and working with the right agencies. Mm. And obviously as soon as you start working with government bodies, there's a, there's a lot more red tape and uh, it becomes a lot more complex, but. I think you'll do it given the evidence <laughs> suggests you'll get there. <laughs> so hopefully. yeah, hopefully. congratulations. It's just really wonderful to see. Thank you, to see no. your work. Yeah, cheers. Uh, last one has a pandemic affected projects that you had planned last year. Um, yes, we had six projects that were due to take place or to go onto site. 
last year. Um, well, we, we did you know, actually, we did have another couple in the UK, which did happen, thankfully. Uh, but yeah, six international projects that had to get postponed, um, four of which is, is, are still hopefully taking place this year. Um, again, that might, might even be touch and go. Um, but uh, yeah, as we say, it's just trying to maximize opportunities and look at ways we can implement the kind of working methods in the UK and a bit closer to home. Um, even in Europe, obviously, the refugee crisis is a big issue. Um, and working with relevant parties in, in those places to see if there's ways we can overcome that as well. That's great. Well, thank you guys for coming today and speaking about um, everything that you, you're doing. Um, I think it's inspired a lot of us. Um, uh, I'm definitely going to take something away from today. Um, no, thank you for having us. Yeah. Cool. And yeah, go Thanks everyone, so go follow them on Instagram <laughs> and social media. <laughs> cool. Oh yeah, and also thanks to Reba for sponsoring our lecture series. And you guys, you'll hear from us, yeah? We'll, you'll, we'll get you in. Okay. <laughs> yeah. and, yeah. and, and I don't know how, how, how it works in terms of um, publicizing this idea that students can come to you in far off places and participate. In, in that way. Um, how does that work? Um, yeah, I mean, we can, obviously we do a lot of that through our Instagram uh, and website, but- Okay, 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 I'll show. We'll, we'll, we'll find you there, we'll, we'll point, maybe Benjamin, I mean, maybe we just need to point students at Yeah, it. I'm sure Pass can uh, put something in our story um, tomorrow, tomorrow morning maybe, something about that. And um, when we post the link to the lecture as well. Great. Great. Awesome. I mean, we can, we have uh, like other material we can send through, which kind of uh, summarizes it all fairly succinctly. So yeah, that'd that. be great. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. 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 Cool. Lovely. Good. All right. Thanks guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Have a nice Thanks evening much. everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.